<laughs> so, welcome to Healing Waters Worship Center. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? Amen. Amen. Share a few uh, words with you, a few scriptures. Um, today, we celebrate the start of uh, the second week of Advent. It is the week of peace. And uh, nothing brings you peace like the coming of the Christ child. That was what he came for. He came to bring us hope. He came to bring us peace. Isaiah records these words. He says that he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace. Of his government and peace, there will be no end. The greatest words of peace were spoken by Christ himself to us. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you... I do not give it to you as the world gives. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be afraid. It was his peace that he gave to us, and it's his peace that we celebrate and live, it, live in today. Amen? Amen. So I only have one announcement for you this morning, and my announcement is that you should read your bulletin. <laughs> there's, good thing, there's good things in there. So uh, with that, I'm going to ask you to stand with me, and let's go into worship together. Heavenly Father, dear God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your, this blessing. God, we thank you for your peace that comforts us. It finds us in our darkest moments, and it begins to give us strength. Father God, if there's somebody here today that hasn't experienced that peace, God, I ask that you give them a special touch, that you give them a, an opportunity to have and know your peace. God, we thank you. We praise you. Meet with us here today. We ask in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Are you awake? We sing this song around Christmas time, but our King is celebrated always. Amen. Joy to the world.
great God we serve. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I can tell you no greater place to be is in his presence. Through it all, any struggle that you're going through, in this moment that you have with God, this is a moment that you should treasure forever. When you step in his presence, nothing else matters but just him and your connection with him. Amen. So if you're new here, we take this time uh, in this service called Corporate Cry Out where we come together as, as believers and believe that God is able. God is able to do exceedingly and abundantly than we can possibly imagine. So we got some prayer requests uh, today. And Lisa Williams has asked us to pray for Uncle Ronnie. He's in the hospital. Also, Aunt Kathy. She's also still in hospice for healing and comfort. Uh, Brent Boland asked us to pray for uh, Tammy Poole, his cousin. Uh, she had a multiple foot and ankle surgeries. Praying for healing. Uh, he also asked us to uh, pray for Judy Marshburn, great aunt, has liver cancer in hospice. Once again, when we hear things like this, when we hear the words cancer, we hear something that it kind of frightens us. We, we have fear, and, but God is able. God is able to do, once again, exceedingly and abundantly. I cannot express how much he can do. God is bigger than anything that we face. So that's why we come together. We come together to pray to God. He wants to hear his children. Amen. So let's go before the Lord in prayer. God, I ask you right now, Father, that you will send your presence in this place. God, we pray for Uncle Ronnie and Aunt Kathy. God, you know their situations, God. We ask for healing and comfort for the families. And even them, God, they, I can't even imagine what they're going through. I can't even imagine what they're thinking. But God, you are able. God, you're able to give us peace when we have done, Father. God, we pray for Tammy Poole. She had multiple surgeries on her foot and ankle. God, that you will heal her, that everything that, go, that has happened, that everything will go well, Father, that the recovery process will go well, that you will be with her. God, we pray for Judy Marsperm, that she's in hospice with liver cancer. God, when we hear these words, we become fearful, but God, you're able. You're able to do things that we couldn't impossibly imagine. God, we pray for our pastors around the world. God, the, this time of year and, the, and this, during this COVID season, God, our pastors have been very stressful. Our pastors have been very, um, have, have depression and all this different stuff that comes upon them. But God, be with our pastors. God, be with our pastor. God, I, can, I can't imagine what he's going through. But God, I ask that you be with him. As, as a spiritual leader for this church, God, as a father, Father, God, I ask that you would be with him and strengthen him. Continue to give him strength. Continue to give him peace, Father. God, we pray for our country. God, our country is in chaos. God, even though sometimes the news doesn't portray it and even sometimes the, the, the newspaper doesn't portray it, but God, we are in chaos. We are in spiritual warfare. God, be with us. I can't express how much we need you. I can't express how much we need you, God. God, we love you so much. And it's in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Let's continue amen. to worship the Lord. So this next song is gonna, um, we're singing is Sea of Victory. And I know most of you know it. We've, we've sung it a bunch. Um, it's one of my favorite songs to sing because I've seen many, many victories in my life. And I know that if you thought about it just a little bit, you could say the same for yourself. Amen. I think a lot of times we focus on the victories we haven't seen yet. And I know that there are victories that I haven't seen just as you. Um, but God's word tells us that we are more than conquerors and overwhelming victory is ours through him, through Jesus Christ. Amen. We don't have to worry about the victories we haven't seen yet because they're, they're, already, they're already won. The Amen. victory has already been won. Yes. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. Amen. And when the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Thank you, Lord. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never God will never We're gonna sing that again. The weapon may be formed. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. Declare that today, church. And when the darkness 
the lie he won't tear down. There's really nothing that will stop him from coming after you. And here's the thing. I know some of you are thinking, well, I've heard this song before, and that word selfless is not in the original song. That's because I changed it. And here's why. God's love is absolutely selfless, and God doesn't come in like a bull. He comes in with specific, laser-like, decisive decisions for you. He doesn't come in haphazardly or crazily, as the term reckless mate. He comes, I mean, he comes looking for you, specifically for you. And he doesn't come looking for you and rip up somebody else or throw them out of the way. He comes directly for you. He's specific. So I want us to sing that, I don't know what you call it. What do y'all call that? The bridge. The bridge. But I want you to sing it like you're in the shower and nobody else is listening to you. Okay, so that means sing it loud. Nobody's listening. Because he came looking for you. No matter what you got going on, he came looking for you. Go ahead. I don't know what to jump is, you just go ahead. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up. sought us out with purpose selflessly you came looking for your people to redeem us and to give us this thing that oftentimes we wrestle with the most in this life because of the lens whereby we interpret it you give us hope and so today would you settle upon the hearts of your people but every man and woman, no matter their age and how much of life they have navigated, would you renew in them the hope that we have only in Jesus. 
There's a lot of things being attacked in today's time. Your name is one of them. We live in a day and time where every name is tolerated but yours. Mention yours and all the offended folks start jumping up. Talk about anything else and everyone's supposed to tolerate it. But Lord, help us to treasure and value and never to back away from the name that has been given whereby all mankind can be saved. Your word says there is no other name under heaven and earth whereby a man or woman can be saved. But it's at the name of Jesus, our Messiah, and our soon coming King. So we look to you today. Thank you for the peace you give, the hope you give here in the gathering together of your people. Now, Father, as we continue to worship now and transition now into just another element of our time together with you, help us to be mindful of who's in the house. And as we take moments in your presence to greet one another, help us to be mindful of who we don't see. Sometimes it's because they were in an early service. Sometimes it's because they were traveling. Sometimes it's because maybe they were ill. Sometimes it's for a variety of reasons, but help us to be mindful of one another. To realize that care extends really through every person in the household of faith, not just one area or subset of ministry. But help us to value one another. Father, as we worship you in giving, I know we do so on digital platforms and many in this type of a setting, but however we do it, help us to be good stewards of all that you've given to all of us. The tithe that belongs to you, thank you for the ability to steward the rest. Thank you, Lord, for your good hand of the Lord that is upon your people. And in this time now, let hope be found as folks greet and as they give and as our focus is still upon you. And we'll give you thanks for what you do in this moment as we worship you in giving and greeting. Through Jesus Christ our Lord and all God's people said, amen. God bless you as you reach out to somebody around you and spread some hope in the house. Love it, love it to hear the people of God connect. It's good stuff. Good to see Doug back in the house of the Lord today. Yeah, good stuff. I have to beat you in cornhole later. I heard you had some weak opponents or something yesterday. Did he hear me? He didn't hear me, did he? The dean walked out already?
That's all right. I got you covered. No worries. You, need a little, you just need a little bit more competition. It's good to be in the house of the Lord together today. I know it's hard to believe that we're in December already, and you know what that means. Christmas is coming. Uh, you will see a lot of advertisements if you are on social media. Uh, first of all, if you are not a part of our HWDC, HWWC Partners page, I want to encourage you to be a part of that. Uh, we put all kinds of advertisements on social media to try to get the word out. So you'll see a lot of those things coming up uh, over the next uh, week, couple of weeks. Of course, we got the Christmas party. I know you've heard all that kind of good stuff. It's going to be an amazing time uh, next week. But stay connected and encourage folks uh, to be a part of things. How many of you know that time happens, you blink and it's gone, and then most of the time if you don't engage with what you wanted to engage in, you have this thing called regret. Anybody ever had regret before? It's like, man, I wish I would have, could have, should have, did a, but I didn't, right? So stay connected. It's vitally, vitally important in the house of God. And uh, so lots of stuff going on, and with lots of stuff, there's opportunity for things to get lost in the translation. And we don't want you to get lost in the translation. We want you to be engaged and connected fully in all the things that uh, the Lord is doing in the house of God here at Healing Waters. So today we're starting a brand new series. I'm just simply calling it the, um, the Wonder Series and rediscovering or recapturing the wonder of the season because a lot of it gets lost in the translation throughout the course of time. Today, we're going to begin by talking about a subject that most of the time uh, we have encountered. How many of you have ever seen a hopeless individual before? We all have, right? But most of the time, we think we know what it looks like. But oftentimes, we really don't. Many times, hopelessness is masked in a suit. It's masked with nice hair or makeup or nice cars, homes. Hopelessness is not relegated to someone who simply assumes the posture of hopelessness. I actually thought about it this morning. What would it look like if all of a sudden we had a game of charades in church and we just said, everybody act out what hopelessness looks like? Well, we wouldn't be, really be able to do it, would we? Because it looks so different across the spectrum of the day and time that we live. And before we go into the Word of God, I want to draw your attention to the screen and just give you a glimpse and a little bit of a taste as we talk about hope this morning. I want you to reflect on the goodness of God through Christ Jesus and the hope that only He provides. Take a look. Hope is a marvelous thing that many people today do not have. 
And I want to talk to you today about hope in Christ Jesus. A lot of mean it's really all in Jesus, really. But I want you to think about something. How many of you have ever had a sugar high? Anybody ever? Everybody, anybody ever felt the hype of sugar? You know what I'm talking about. If you've got little kids, you give them the hype of sugar, and what do they do? They'll bolt everywhere. And then what happens to them on the edge of the sugar rush? Down they go, boy, and it is just absolutely a train wreck. Well, what we have to offer as a, as a body of believers in Christ Jesus is not hype. It's not something that just should elevate us and cause us to crash. Do you realize today the worst thing that happens to Christianity is Christians? Because we tend to ride the wave of hype to another wave of hype, and we don't have the consistency of the hope that we're supposed to have. So we are bubbly when everything's going good. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, God is good. Oh, it's so good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah, good to see you. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Hallelujah, glory to God, glory to God. He's good, he's good. Let everything fall apart, and we are like the child whose sugar has run out, and we are lethargic in the kingdom of God and absolutely disconnected. Anybody, not you, pumpkin, but have you ever met someone or known someone that's been that way? When things are going good, it's actually the opposite in today's time. When everything is going good, most Christians back away from the things of God, even the house of God, until things go bad. And what happens is, is we create a paradigm in the world that shows a kind of Jesus that should never be shown. So I want to talk to you today uh, about Jesus, who is really our hope, and rediscovering the wonder of hope itself. Oftentimes when you visit with someone who is hopeless or you've seen them, their attire doesn't matter. It's not what tells you their story. It's not the car they drive, the meal they are eating. Most of the time, hopelessness is deep-seated within the eyes. You ever looked at someone and it looked like they had it all together until you took a moment to stare in their eyes and you realized there was some deep-seated hopelessness or sadness? Have you ever been there? And, and that is where we are in the world today. Anybody ever put on the mask before to make everybody think everything is going great when everything is absolutely falling all apart on the inside and our lives are filled with disappointments? Shock and awe is around us on a regular basis, but the good news of not just the Christmas season and the month of December, the good news is, is that cradled in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes was more than just a baby, more than just a, a provision of something good uh, for people to, to get out of hell free card. It was hope that sustains or should sustain the people of God. I want to go all the way back to the Old Testament with you, and they don't necessarily have these scriptures, uh, unless they may have added them between, because I threw them on them in the first service. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 says this, probably it's good sometimes to, uh, to read the scripture. By the way, if you didn't know, we do have Wednesday night service, and we've been doing some studies together in the scripture, and one of the things that we've talked about recently is how many people don't know what they don't know. Because we relied on Google and Bible apps and things like that to where many people, uh, if, if we actually took a Bible in hand, sometimes we probably wouldn't be able to find uh, certain things. But that nonetheless, Isaiah chapter 11 says this, There shall come forth a rod from Jesse, or from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And then Jeremiah would prophesy and he would say this, Behold, the days are coming saith the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. How many of you are thankful for Jesus today? I'm thankful for my Savior. I'm thankful that I met him and that we have the opportunity and the privilege to walk with him. And may the Lord add his blessing and anointing to his word today. And help us to see some things and re-understand some things. You remember, notice I said re-understand some things. And so the prophets make this statement. They said, look, there's a rod that's going to come from the stem of Jesse. Well, we know Jesse is a young man by the name of David's father. Everybody remember King David, right? And then Jeremiah says that, that the Lord, Yahweh, God, is going to raise out of David, a branch of righteousness or a king. Well, we know that that king is who? 
Jesus Christ, Yeshua, our Messiah, who has come to redeem mankind. So I think it's very important and I think quite pertinent that we go and look at what David had to say about Yahweh that translates into the Jesus that we now know today. Because we know that God wrapped in flesh is Jesus Christ. Right? He was 100% God, 100% man. The, the doctrine that he was 50% and 50% is a theological fallacy. Don't ever fall for such a construct. And so everything that David would say about Yahweh is everything wrapped up in Yeshua, our Messiah. Okay, and so I want us to see some of those things. And then on the heels of that, I'm going to give you 10 points. I know some of you go, oh, dear God, why has he got to give 10 points? I promise it will go Fast, but I know what some of you are going to do. All right, point number one. All right, where's number two? Where's number two? Where's number three? What time is it? How long is it going to take him to get through? Don't worry about it. Look at your neighbor and tell him, don't get nervous. I would relate like this. Don't get nervous like Dean would get nervous playing me in cornhole or how Doug would get nervous playing me in, in cornhole. I just would relay it in that term. I wanted it to be relatable uh, today. But here's some things that the psalmist David would declare in the 33rd Psalm, verse 22. Here's what he says. Let your mercy, O Lord. Remember, he's talking about Yahweh, God. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us just as we have what? Hope in you. This hope in you. God. The 38th Psalm, verse 15 says, For in you, O Lord, remember he's talking about Yahweh, God, for in you, O Lord, I what? Hope. I have my. Now, I want you to understand hope is not just positive thinking. Hope is not you going, I'm thinking a positive thought today. How many of you have ever tried to hold on to a positive thought? Nobody? Three of us, dear Lord, it's not a trick, I promise it's not a trick. Well, here, I'll raise my hand with you, pumpkin. How many of you have ever had a positive thinking, tried to, try to, okay, yeah, yes, I see, it's all right, it's safe, we all raised our hand. How many of you have ever had that derailed by something that happens in life? Oh, boy, yeah, it happens all the time. So positive thinking is not hope. Hope is what anchors us, and you'll see that as we go through our journey this morning. So the psalmist says, For in you, O Lord, I hope you will hear, O Lord, my God, talking about Yahweh, but again, the attributes and the reality are extended from Christ through Christ to all of us. Psalm 39, verse 7 says, And now, Lord, what do I wait for? My what? Hope, not positive thinking, my hope is in who? You, the Lord. And, and there's another time in Psalm chapter 42 that the psalmist David does what many of you, us, do on a regular basis. Have you ever had a conversation with yourself? How did that work out for you? Sometimes it doesn't work out too good, does it, right? Psalm 42, verse 5 through 11, David says, Why are you cast out, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within? You ever had a conversation that answered yourself? And then he answers himself. He says, Hope in God for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. This is a beautiful depiction of what God, Yahweh, and through Jesus, God wrapped in flesh, is to us. David is in a difficult time. Most of the time, he is writing what's called imprecatory psalms. He is struggling and he is having hardship in his life. And he's, 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 he gets bewildered on a regular basis, right? And so here he's writing, he says, why are you so downcast, soul? Why are you so disquieted within? I can see a little bit of a depression maybe in there. And he says, uh, uh, hope in God, he's talking to himself, and I will yet praise him for the help of his countenance. This is what is beautiful about this. Here's what he's saying. I know if I can just get God to look at me and to see me where I am, I'm going to be okay. That's a, a beautiful thing in reality. And then verse 6, he says, oh my God, my soul is cast down. Look, he seems a little bipolar, doesn't he? He's like, oh my soul, why are you calling? Oh, hope in God. Oh God. You, do you see the, the seesaw? We laugh, but we've been on it. Some of you are on it now. It's that seesaw of life. He says, oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. And then he flips right back. Therefore, I remember you from the land of the Jordan. Yeah. From the heights of Hermon, from the hills of Mizar. Deep calls to deep but the noise of your waterfalls. And all your waves and billows have gone over me. The Lord will com 
command is loving kindness in the daytime. In the night his song shall be with me. A prayer to the God of my life and I will say to God my rock. Oh, here it is. I will say to God, why have you forgotten me? You see bipolar David coming out? Why have you forgotten me? Why do I go on mourning because of the oppression of my enemy? That's a good question, David. Why do you keep doing that foolishness when you know who God is? As with the breaking of my bones, my enemies reproach me. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? And then verse 11 is a repeat of verse 5. Why are you downcast, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within? What is the answer with? What? Hope in God, I will yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. You've got to realize everything that Yahweh was to David, Christ is to all of us. He is our very present help in time of need. Psalm 71, there's a lot of scripture I'm going to give you this morning, so it may be a little rapid for uh, rapid fashion, but you can always go back and watch the replay or uh, write fast. Psalm 71, verse 14 through 16, he says this, but I will hope, how long? Continue. Do you know a lot of people have irregular hope patterns? It's like an irregular heartbeat. Irregular hope patterns where we are hopeful when there's no pain. We are hopeful when there's more month left at the or more money left at the end of the month than more month left at the end of the money. We are hopeful when everybody likes us and everybody's liked our Facebook post and everybody's liked our social media post and everybody is singing Kumbaya in the family and everybody's getting along. But oftentimes our hope wanes because of life and how it happens. But that's not the way it's supposed to be for the believers. My he says, and, and, and will praise you yet more and more. Do you realize the construct in the American church is simply this, praise the Lord when everything is good, and you can oftentimes tell in the American church, not, not you of course, but everybody else, but in the American church you can oftentimes tell when times are good because the praise and worship level, regardless of what's going on, people are like, yeah, God, you are good, mm-hmm, yeah, you're good, and everybody's going crazy, and let times get bad, it's like, I will sing of your love forever. I want to go home. I want to go somewhere else and eat dinner. I want to go somewhere else and eat dinner. Y'all say, that's not the words, but that's how... When, when hope is not what we think it is, we, and we go through spikes and, and peaks and valleys, and we're not supposed to be that way. He said, my mouth shall tell of your righteousness and of your salvation all the day, for I do not know their limits. He said, I will go in the strength of the Lord God, and I will make mention of your righteousness of yours alone. But what is the first part of that verse? He says, I will hope continually. You see, the very same, yeah, preach about it, baby girl. It's all right. You're all right. You talk to him. You tell him. But here's the thing. The very reality that David knew in the Old Testament is the very realities that you and I are able to experience in our life because of Yeshua, Jesus, our Messiah. The very realities that David was able to have hope and rest in God And I can think of nobody else's life to kind of glean from because David's life was absolutely crazy. Up, down, up, down. And he learned a lot of cave lessons and a lot of horrible lessons. But God sustained him and we're drawing from that experience. The first thing that I want to give you today is simply this hope. This hope will never disappoint you. This hope will not disappoint. How many of you have ever been disappointed by people, places, or processes? How many of you have dissipated? dissipated? Whew, that's a new word. That's like stripping the paint off your wall. You dissipated it. You're disappointed some person, place, or process. We all have done those things. But God, in hope in Christ, never disappoints. Psalm 119, verse 16 says this, Uphold me according to your word that I may live, and do not let me be ashamed of my what? Hope. Who was this hope in? God. Why was this hope in God? Because it was the only thing in his life that was unshakable, untainable, and able to sustain him. It was the hope in God. It was not mere positive thinking. It was taking all of his life and laying it or leaning it on 
God the Father, Yahweh, as we are to do in Christ Jesus. The 130th Psalm, verse 5 says this. If He says, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I do what? Hope. Many people today don't know the word, and because they don't know the word, they have hope that fluctuates based on storms and difficulties. And here's what I know. You are going to have trouble. You are going to have difficulty, but I've got good news in the house for you today that no matter where you go or what you go through, the hope of God in Christ Jesus is still relevant and very real for the people of God. And we ought not be up and down and up and down. There ought to be a fervor in the people of God, not a political fervor, not not a, a subject fervor on the outside, but a fervor in Christ Jesus to this, remember this song, this little light of, oh, you've heard, I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, and this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, and then the kids' church, you do like every day, no, 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 hold on, every day, every day, hey, every day, hey, and every way, I'm I'm gonna let my little light shine and then he goes on, on a Monday he get, oh I can't go into all that but here's the point of it all <laughs> the point of all that is your hope should not be there should be a brightness and a fervency in the body of Christ every single day and not just when you feel good because you are not going to feel good. But there is something about the reality of the Word of God, the presence of God, and the power of God in the life of a believer that when all hell has broke loose against you, you are standing there and you are vibrantly shining and everybody in the world is wanting to know why are they not broken yet? Why? Because hope will never disappoint. i got to hurry up. That's just point one of ten. Don't get nervous. The hope doesn't disappoint. Number two, this hope is life. Jesus is life. Proverbs 13 and verse 12 tells us this story that many of you realize and know because of the things you've been through. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. How many of you ever experienced that in life where you've hoped for something and it didn't happen when you thought it should happen and you got absolutely nauseous on the inside, broken on the inside. But when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. That's what Jesus is to all of us. Jeremiah 14, 8 would tell us the story. Oh, the hope of Israel is Savior in time of trouble. Why should you be like a stranger in the land and like a traveler who turns aside to tarry for a night? What does he call Jesus there? It's a prophetic word. He says, oh, hope of Israel. Yeah, he is. But he's the hope of we who are Gentile as well because he came looking for us as well. This hope is our, brings blessing to our life. Jeremiah 17, verse 7 and following says, Blessed is the man who trusts in, or woman who trusts, person who trusts in the Lord and whose hope is in the Lord. For he or she shall be planted by the waters which spread out its root by the river and will not fear when the heat comes. Its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will it cease from yielding fruit. What on earth is it that causes men and women to prosper and bloom when everything and everyone else is crazy? I'll tell you who it is. His name is Jesus Christ. He is our hope. He is everything or should be everything to we who believe because he alone brings blessing. Since when wasn't it good enough? Was it not good enough just to be saved? And now we want all these other things without seeking him first. Paul would write in Romans 8, 24, for we were saved in this hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? Listen, when you and I came to meet Jesus, Jesus did not come in physical form. 
What happened? We heard the preaching of the Word of God. We heard the story. The, the power of God, the anointing of the Holy Spirit resonated through the Word of God that was preached. And all of a sudden, broken men and women were pulled to the reality of their life in broken shambles and darkness without a Savior. And what did we do? We called on the name of the Lord and He saved us. Why? Because in that moment, we had hope. What is it about a book that tells an eternal ancient story about a man that lived and died and rose again and is seated at the right hand of the Father that would convict a 12-year-old boy on a Royal Ranger camp out that up until that point hadn't done a lot of stuff other than mess up at home, tear stuff up at home, disobeyed parents. I'll tell you what it was. It was hope wrapped in Jesus that's able to pull any man, woman, child, young person into a relationship with the Lord. Not only is this hope something that brings blessing, but he brings stability. This hope brings stability in this life. This is a crazy, crazy life. It rocks and it rolls. But here's what Paul writes in Romans 12, verse 9 and following. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with what? Brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continually steadfast in prayer, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality, blessed the, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, be of the same mind toward one another. Don't set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble, and don't be wise in your own opinion. Anybody ever played Jenga before? I, that's all right. Did I say that right? I messed it up the first service. You ever seen the long Jenga with the two by four pieces? That's a frustrating game when you're trying to win. I'm not that competitive. Wink, wink, and you're up there trying to pull, and you're like, oh, this is my time. Jenga champion right here. And you start pulling that board, and you get it out, and it's like, hoo, 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 slam, and all of them fall to the ground. It's like hope is shattered in that moment for, for you because you wanted to win. But hope is just like that piece that shatters the whole Jenga board. If you pull hope out of the life of a believer, this whole passage falls apart. Your love will have hypocrisy in it. You'll cling to what is evil. If you don't have hope, you won't give preference to one another. You'll be as selfish as you can absolutely be. You won't have diligence. You'll have laziness. You won't be fervent in spirit. You'll be absolutely cold as a cucumber. You won't serve the Lord, but you'd rather want to be served by Him. You won't rejoice at all because hope is where our rejoicing comes from. That is why a man or a woman can be surrounded Surrounded by the tornadoes of life and in the middle of it all you see them lift their hands with joy on their face and authentic worship coming out of them as they bless the name of the Lord. Why? Because they have hope. It wasn't a fleeting. Well, I just, brother, I have trouble being patient. Well, maybe the trouble is not the patience. Maybe the trouble is your hope is deficient. Because I have a problem being generous. Well, maybe the problem in your generosity, maybe the problem is you've lost hope. I don't want to bless those that persecute me. I want to pistol whip them. Well, I probably shouldn't have said it like that because somebody's going to sound bite me now on that and say, I knew it. I knew that's what he would like. It's, you know, it's always after it flies out of your mouth that you realize, oops. Y'all would, well, you probably wouldn't be tripped out all the stupid stuff I get accused of by people sometimes. It's crazy. I don't want to be hospitable. Bah! Well, maybe your problem in your, your lack of hospitality, sweet pea. Maybe the problem, maybe the problem is hope has gone away from your life. I don't want to rejoice. I don't want to weep with somebody. I got my own problems. I don't want to be of the same mind towards other people. I want them to be a same mind towards me. Maybe the problem is not everything else. Maybe the problem is hope because Paul put right in the middle of that rejoicing in hope. And just like that Jenga, you pull hope out and everything else starts to crumble. This hope also brings comfort. Have you ever needed comfort before? Romans 15, verse 4 and following, for whatever things were written before were written for our learning. That we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Yeah. 
hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another. Ooh, you mean I got to be patient? Yeah. But remember, you can't be patient if you don't have any hope. And hope in this regard only comes from Jesus Christ. That you may be with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, this hope brings me comfort because he's the one that holds me in the middle of the storm. He's the one that absolutely goes before me. You've heard me tell you this over and over. He got there well before you did. He'll always be there. This hope puts us into a position. Oh, yes, it does. Romans 15, 12, and 13 says, and again, Isaiah says, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he who shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles have what? Guess what? We're Gentiles. I know somebody just jumped out. You see, why has he got to scream like that? Because I don't know. It's just the way I'm made. We were grafted into this vine. For God so loved the world, both to the Jew and to the Gentile. You see, everything Yahweh was to Israel, Jesus is to all. And he is our hope. He says, in him the Gentiles have hope. Verse 13, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Many people can't get in touch with the presence and power of God because they walk around so hopeless and that affects their worship, that affects their joy, and then they want everybody to pick them up when they have not picked themselves up in Christ Jesus alone. It's a slippery slope, is it not? It's this hope that keeps us going, Doug. 1 Corinthians 15, 19 says this, in this life, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men, most pitiable or most miserable. The point of it is here is that, you know what? This hope that Jesus gives is not just for this temporary blob. I'm not calling you a blob. I'm, I mean life, okay? It's about one by God, Facebook, hashtag, pastor called us blobs, hashtag, not happy with my frame or something crazy like that. We are all temporary. This whole thing is temporary. It at all, one day is all going to be gone. And here's the thing. The hope of Jesus is not just simply relegated to this temporary confined space. It is an eternal hope. And it is not simply, well, I got my get out of hell free card today. It is, I belong to Jesus. He is my hope. There is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it is that hope that is absolutely puts us into position for a relationship with our Savior every single day. You can't have joy and peace if you don't have hope. And if you don't have hope, you don't have Christ. You just have positive thinking. And that only goes so far as we know. This hope keeps us going. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. Well, I just told you that scripture. Colossians 1, verse 3 and following. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints. Why did you love all the saints? Look at the answer. Because of the hope which is laid up for you where? In heaven of which you've heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you and it all, has also in all the world and is bringing forth fruit as it is among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. I remember sitting years ago and you'd hear people testify about a land they'd never been to. They could keep going because heaven was worth fighting and waiting for, fighting the good fight of faith, finishing well, hearing well done. I sat as we drove home from some meetings and I was talking about some of the folks that have gone on before the Lord and I mentioned some folks. I said, you know, I wonder what Sister Lockamy would think today. Mom, Pop Bloomer, Pop Simmons. I named a host of them and just wondered how would they be today if they were to see all of us. I wonder what they would First of all, they'd probably get mad and be like, what in the world did you want us back here for? We were having a great time <laughs> being in the presence of the Lord eternally. This hope keeps us going, ladies and gentlemen, and always will. First Thessalonians 5.18, but let 
us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Hebrews 6.11, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence of faith, of, full assurance, of your full assurance of hope until the end. This hope, folks, keeps you going. In my last couple of points, you say, well, already? Yes, already. See? Give yourself a hand. You didn't try to keep track. Maybe you did and just lost count, but here it is. This hope is contagious. Did you know that? This, is, this hope is contagious. You know, that's why the enemy doesn't want you coming together. Did you know that? That's, a, that's why the enemy wants us to get so accustomed to church on video that we don't come together anymore. That's why the enemy wants us to get so accustomed to being offended by everybody. That we just disconnect. Hebrews 10, verse 23. I want to give you a new look at the scripture. It's not a new scripture. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. Our hope and faith. It's all in Christ, right? For he who promised is. And let us consider one another in order to stir up good works. What's verse 25 say? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as in the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. There ought to be a desire in the people of God to get to the house of God to encourage other believers and to be encouraged the same way. There ought to be a desire in the people of God to get to the house of God, to worship God, instead of finding all the reasons we find. Let me turn around. I don't I don't want you to think I'm looking at you or in the camera to find all these reasons why well little Johnny Bobo had a bloody nose or had a snotty nose and all seven of us had to stay home to wipe his nose my, my, my car got a flat but I got seven other ones but I had to couldn't go to church because of the you, you know what I'm talking about the enemy will give you all kinds of stuff to get you away from one another and I'm not trying to be offensive well if they just did things a little bit different, I'd probably come to church more often. If he didn't holler at us, <laughs> I'd just get past it. Could you, I mean, what would you think I stood here saying? Well, the scripture says that be thou is thinest though. <laughs> yeah, I, I appreciate the conjecture, but here's the, here's the point. The enemy will give you all kinds of stuff. Well, I don't like to... The, you know, before we remodeled the sanctuary during the, co the pandemic and spent all the resources to do all this, you know how many times people say, I just, just my vision, the, the red and the green, is just, it just almost gives me a migraine. I don't know what almost a migraine is. Uh, I don't know what almost, it's like almost gas. What is almost gas? I saw, oh, nope, it was almost, I, sorry, that's terrible, that's horrible. <laughs> I don't know. If you want to know what that is, Pastor Steve will tell you what that is. He'll, he'll walk you through that. But here's the thing. The enemy will do his absolute best to pull you away from one another. They looked at me wrong. <laughs> they might not like me. They didn't shake my hand. They didn't hand me a paper bulletin. They ran out. I don't, did, have, did we run out today? That was just prophetic if we did. We didn't, Okay. They ran out of bulletins, but I came in and there were no bulletins for me. <clears throat> you see what I'm talking about? We, we find reasons. And the enemy gets in there and he, he twists that, that just grinding into us. And all the time he pulls us away, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Do you know why we don't need to forsake the assembling of ourselves together? Because we find value with one another. And listen to me. If you find value in the kingdom of God that you're connected with, you ought to be inviting people that don't know the Lord to come alongside of you and come to church with you. Well, three people agree. You know, there's a lot of things I edit that hit my mind. A lot of stuff, sometimes I'm like, oh, filter needs to grab that one. We, the church has become so lazy. I'm, I'm, look, I'm not kidding. We've become so lazy. We don't even want to invite people to come to church with us anymore. Here's what we put, here's what we put church growth to. The pastor needs to do that. According to Scripture, my role and my calling and my job is to equip those that you bring into the house of hold of faith. That's really what Scripture defines. I know people like to argue it, but I mean, read it. 
But the enemy does. He, I, let me get back on. I'm chasing all kinds of squirrels and rabbits today. It's hunting season, so I know we're chasing all this kind of stuff. But it's contagious, isn't it? Listen, how many times, maybe today, how many times have you come into the house of God and absolutely, but before you walked in the door, you wanted to turn around and go home and pop some popcorn and watch something else or, or not even be here? There have been moments that people, I've seen people come in, they're like, you say good morning, they're like, yeah, man. And by the time it's over with, there's a smile on their face or they're laughing during a moment in the service. Why? Because the joy and hope of the Lord in the body of Christ is absolutely contagious. That is why somebody over here can be absolutely in darkness and somebody over here is having a hoop and hollering time in the Lord. And then all of a sudden, hope transfers from one to another because it's contagious and we go what are they shouting about what are they and then we connect together and we fellowship together and we hear the word and we're challenged nobody wants to be challenged anymore we just just let us do what we want because it's a free country it's contagious let me hurry up i only got two more points come on play something for me so i can start bringing the plane down we're at about a hundred thousand i don't think you can be at a hundred thousand feet but it's up there Not only does this hope contagious, but this hope empowers us. Listen to me. Jesus Christ empowers us as we worship and come before him in his word by the power of the Holy Spirit. But we don't know what it is to tarry anymore. We just want to get in and get out. There used to be a day that people would linger around the altar and pray and seek God. We don't do that anymore. Everybody runs to the hills and everybody says, well, pastor, why don't you do this to get us in such and such a place? Well, my question back to you is why would you leave such and such a place? Why do I have to do something to get you back from a place that you willingly walked away from? Boy, that's harsh. I, can we edit that? <laughs> Probably not. But that's, some, that, that's the tension that we deal with. Everybody, tell us something nice and pat us on the head. I want to challenge you. I want you to be changed. I don't, listen, I don't want a group of weak Christians walking around. <laughs> God's called us to be an army of people. We've got to be thicker-skinned. And, and more equipped than we are. We need to be better equipped. We need to be more filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to be actively pursuing God instead of expecting one man or one ministry to come and just give it to you. That's not happening. Actually, that's never happened. You say, look what Jesus did. Uh, that's God. Last time I looked around the room, none of us are. This hope empowers us, 1 Peter 3, 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that's inside of you. With meekness and fear, having a good conscience, and when they defame you as evildoers, those who revile your good conduct in Christ may be ashamed. There'll come a time I've had it happen in life, maybe you've had it happen in life, when it just seems like everything is broke loose against you. But you've not been broken, you've not been obliterated beyond recognition. And someone looks at you and you say, they say, so how come you haven't given up? And some of the stuff that we've encountered, some of the stuff that I encounter on the other hats that I wear at different times and different spaces and places, I've had people say, why do you keep doing what you're doing you take all this? And why do you keep doing this when all this happens? And why do you keep serving the Lord when it seems like every time this happens or this happens and, and your body's this and your blah, 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 blah. You may tell you why? Because he's my hope that has broken down every wall. He is everything to me. And there have been moments I've sat in places, oh, I wanted to sit there and be like, <laughs> bring the tin cup on the bar and say, oh, woe is me. I said the bar. Not that I gone to a bar, but I meant like bars on the prison cell. Sorry. Uh, that'll be another clip later on. <laughs> McCarty. Ten cup bar. Why did I even repeat it? I don't even know. But, <laughs> but <laughs> when someone walks up to you and they say, why haven't you given up? With everything you've been through, why haven't you given up? Well, let me tell you about the hope that I have. Peter said, and be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks for a reason for the hope that's inside of you. See, we want to create, and I'm not against them. We're going to go on out door knocking. You got to be a little careful in that nowadays. Hey, you just get off the porch. (laughs) If you didn't know what that noise was, 
See me later. The best evangelism tool that the body of Christ can use in today's time is let the hope of Jesus Christ shine through you as you navigate life's trials. And those that are around you look at you and say, why have you not this? Why have you not that? Well, let me tell you why. Because he is the one that has sustained me. His hope empowers me. And you get closer and closer to the Lord. Why? And finally, because this hope is Jesus. Hebrews 6, 19, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, which enters the presence behind. That's Jesus. One sacrifice once and for all, Yeshua, God wrapped in flesh for you and for me. Hebrews 7, 19, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, there is the bringing in of a better hope. You see, David talked about the hope that he had in Yahweh, which is powerful, but limited in scope because at that time, only David and the people of Israel had that connectivity ability, connection ability. But here comes Jesus. And you would read the words that God so loved the world. Now all of a sudden, instead of to Israel, still to Israel, by the way, that didn't change. Now, to the Gentiles. A better hope. You say a better hope, better only in the sense that it was able to grab more people. Relegated here. Now, whosoever will come to Jesus. It's a better hope. Look at the ending of that verse. Through which we draw near to God. We have hope. I've had it all the time to those that believe. But we run from one another. We don't gather together. There's just a host of things. And my hope through this season, this December season, is every Sunday give you another aspect, another piece. And I know you already know this. All of them is Jesus. But all of these aspects that we're going to look at, that we know it as Advent. We're going to see how it applies to our life. Charles Spurgeon said this of hope. He said, hope itself is like a star. Not to be seen in the sunshine of prosperity, but only to be discovered in the night of adversity. Jesus. Oh, he is brighter than any brightness you could ever think of. But when it's dark outside, in life, The church ought to be shining brighter today than at any other time. We've all, we, the church should have been getting brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter and still it's like we've gotten dimmer and more regressive. So today, I can think of no better way to commemorate and remember this hope that we have in Jesus Christ than to participate in a time of communion together. I'm going to ask you to stand with me. He's given you hope. He's given you hope. And this hope is an amazing hope. This hope, he loved you enough that he gave his life. He shed his own blood so that you wouldn't have to. Yeah, this is the reality of it. And hell is real, ladies and gentlemen. It's real. I don't care what the, the, the friendly preachers on TV want to say to try to, oh, hell's just really what you make. Uh, it's really your worst. No, hell's a real place. It's bad. It was never reserved for us. It was reserved for the devil. It was never for mankind, but sin entered into the world. And today, in just a moment, we're going to have a time of communion together. But I... I I, before I do that, I have to, I've got to just pause and ask a question. You're here this morning, and, and I'm, there's a lot of times I'll tell you not to bow your eyes and close your head, and that's what people do at this time. They bow their eyes, shut their head off. It's just get, let's, let's eat the snack pack at church, and let's run out the sanctuary. But you're here this morning, and I'm looking, I want to look right in your eyes, and I want you, this is not something to be ashamed of. You're here this morning, and you're away from God. I, I wouldn't even plan on doing this. 
but I've learned a long time ago to listen to those stops by the Spirit of God in me. If you're here this morning and you're away from God, something's just disconnected. And you want to make it right with God this morning. Before we even do this, I'm going to ask you, you say, oh dear Lord, now he's wanting to ask me to do something. I just feel pressed to do this and to stop because Jesus walked a long way for us. You're here and you need to make some things right with the Lord before we take another step forward. I just want you, don't even look at anybody else. Just step out of your seat and come stand in this altar real quick. Come on. I know you're in here, otherwise the Lord wouldn't have stopped me like that because I was getting ready to have the ushers. Come on. Let's come stand in this altar. I got There's some things I got to get made right. Come on. Don't wait. Don't second thought. That's why your heart's been beating like it has for the last seven minutes. Step out of your seat and come on. Come on up to the front as quick as you can. We're going to pray. And don't get tired of standing. If you've got to sit down for a moment and rest your legs, that's all right. But if you're here and that applies to you, get out of your seat and just come up to the front just as quick as you can. Others have already come up. But come on, just as quick as you can. You say, well, maybe we'll get done with this and I can have this stuff. Listen, don't ignore that. Anybody else, we're going to pray in just a moment. I'm not going to belabor it. I want you to step out real quick. I gotta, there's, I've got to, or maybe you've never given your life to the Lord. I don't know. Sometimes we take for granted that everybody in the house has known Jesus. So when the Lord prompts me to do this stuff, I don't believe in just willy-nilly doing altar calls for the sake of a service and a program. It's different. You see what's different when the Lord deals with, with us to do it. But maybe you're here and you've never accepted Jesus as Savior. He loves you with an everlasting love just the way you are, and he wants to do a great work in your life. Anybody else before we pray? He said, well, that's hard. You didn't tell us to bow our eyes or nothing. That's okay. We don't have to hide behind a crutch. We're a family. We love one another. It's okay. You're safe. We're going to pray in just a second. Anybody else? Sad reality is some of you will go to your car later and go, I wish. So, Father, at this moment, those of you that have come forward, I just want you and pastoral staff that are there, just talk to them and pray with them. I want you to just ask the Lord, whatever it is, to forgive you, to cleanse you, and to wash you from all, righteous, all unrighteousness, and that he will solidify himself continually as Lord and Savior of your life. Lord, all of us present ourselves together to you. Lord, your word tells us that if we go into communion and there's some things going on that ought not be, that that's dangerous. And so, for these and for all of us, would you search us and try us and know us on the inside like the psalmist would even pray. Search, try, look on the compartments and see. Wash us and make us clean. Forgive us, Lord, for the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. For the moments that we've stepped outside the confines of the will of your word, wash us and make us clean today. Give us hope again. It's always been in the hope that is found in Jesus. Let that hope resonate in the hearts and minds and lives of your people today. Help us to realize that the enemy is working overtime to dissuade, discourage, disenfranchise, and disconnect the people of God. Help us today. Help these your people. Thank you for just a moment that you grab our hearts. Thank you for the moments of pause that you have control over, that you're able to just simply stop and say, no, there's more that you wish to do. And so all that we are, we present to you. And you would do a work in our lives that we are not capable of doing in and of ourselves. And for the work that you do, we will be faithful to give you the praise, the honor, the glory, and the credit for it all. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name. You see, these un what maybe some would define as uncomfortable moments are really how the Lord pulls us and draws us. I think sometimes we get so uh, unaccustomed to it that when it happens, we become spectators, scoffers, and judgitators. You know what a judgitator is, don't you? It's a spectator that sits back and judges. Only God 
could take that which is broken and make it new again. Only God is able to take a fractured life. And ladies and gentlemen, if you just think you can come, you, that we need to come to an altar one time, no, nah, that's not true. We have to make regular trips. The Apostle Paul said he had to crucify the flesh every day. So this is a daily thing. It's a daily thing. So in just a moment, I'm going to invite all of you that wish to participate. The ushers are going to help us to simply come down the aisle, grab the elements of communion, and very reverently and worshipfully go back to your seat. And we're going to partake of communion together in just a moment. So ushers, if you would help us, Mason, just hold both of those. Get the, the bread in one hand. You can just hold both until you get two hands freed up. Yeah, you go ahead and sing. You're good. night that Jesus was about to be offered, you know the narrative, he took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he told his disciples looking at them at this triclidium style table, he told them, as often as you eat this bread, drink this cup, he said you do so in remembrance of me. So today I'm calling you to remember the hope, the hope that we all have. Hope that is enough to sustain our soul no matter what we go through. And as we pray today, as we partake, I will tell you on the heels of taking communion together, I want us to go back to that chorus and just sing it one time through. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. And that will be basically our benediction, just singing that as we continue to do what God's called us to do. So, Father, thank you for your goodness, 
the hope that you wrapped for us in yourself when Yahweh was wrapped in flesh come to earth in Jesus fully God fully man you gave your life fully for us you paid a price you didn't owe what we owed a debt we could never pay and so today we bless the bread and the cup that we hold in our hand these mere elements today they don't save us, but they draw our mind back to the place that we physically weren't present for, that the narrative tells us the story of your body that was broken, striped at the hall of praetorium, pierced on the cross, and the blood that was spilled, willingly shed for all of us. Today, in this moment, we do this in remembrance of you as you draw us back to the hope that each of us have in Christ Jesus our Lord. Bless these elements, we pray. In Christ's name, amen. You may partake of them together. Thank you, Lord, for your grace, the hope that we have. A hope that we really don't fully fathom sometimes. And Lord, as we remember and are stirred in our heart and soul today. I want to say thank you for challenging our lives today. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives together corporately. And as we close together today just worshiping you, would you go with your people, bless them, guide them, and keep them, and help us to be and do all that you called us to be and do here at Healing Waters, to our community, and really to all that we meet that you would be glorified. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. What a wonderful name. What a wonderful name it is.